Hello out there. Welcome to your next mission video podcast. We have a great show for you today that focuses on the United States Army Combined Arms Center at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, also known as CAC. The CAC command team will tell us the history of the organization and the challenges they're facing in this uncertain time for our country. It's going to be a good one, so stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome to your next mission video podcast, where we tell the stories of those who have served in the past and those who are serving today. From transition to financial wellness, VA benefits to mental health, we cover issues facing veterans, active military, and their families. Now here's your host, the 12th Sergeant Major of the Army and co-founder of the American Freedom Foundation, Jack L. Tilly. Hello out there, warriors, past and present, and your families, and thank you for your service to our great country. Before we get started, I personally want to thank our presenting sponsors, Navy Federal Credit Union, whose members are the mission, and Purdue Global, where you can start your comeback, with additional sponsorship from Blue Cross Blue Shield, FEP Dental, and Blue Cross Blue Shield, FEP Vision, and USAA. Together, they make your next mission happen. They love our veterans and family. I'm going to say every doggone week, we love them too. As I said earlier, we have a great show. Today, focus on a United States Army Combined Arms Center. And here comes the end. Now, I'm so excited to introduce Com Command Arms Center, Command Team, Lieutenant General Milford H. Beagle, Jr., Commanding General, and CSM Stephen H. Helton, Command Sergeant Major. Welcome to the show. That's the amazing. It's great to be on the show. And it's truly an honor. I'm very humble. You have a lot of people that you get on your show. I watch it play across all the socials. And so this is truly humbling, humbling to be added to that list. <laughs> oh, I appreciate yeah, it. I wasn't hey. stressed out at all, SMA, until you told me the viewership size. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> <good. laughs> well, look here. I know, I know we're going to have a great time. We're going to talk about some good stuff to help our Army out. Before we do that, though, I'd like each one of you to tell the audience just a little bit about yourself. And, sir, we'll, we'll start with you. Yeah, I appreciate it, that's mate. I'll start, you know, like most people have heard, some people use, you know, the term, you know, their last name and their soldier. I'll use the same and say, my name is Beagle and I'm an American soldier. And that's the caveat I'll put on it. You know, most people don't put the American in front of it, but I am an American soldier. There, there's a huge difference uh, when you look across the landscape. Uh, very quickly, I'll tell you, I'm a father, I'm a father-in-law, I'm a husband, I'm a grandfather, and I'm a pet owner. And just to walk through it real quick, you know, my oldest son, he's, he's deployed right now, so he's a captain in the Army. We've got one just graduated college, but he's some kind of way boomerang back home. Uh, we think that's going to be temporary because that's not the way college works, right? Once you get them out, they <laughs> stay. <laughs> but this one boomerang, boomerang back, but it's it's all good. Uh, lovely granddaughter, uh, my spouse of 32 years. People ask me how I have succeeded in the Army, and I tell them, my, my key secret is I married the daughter of a CSM. Ah. That's not what that's all I have to say, right? So I've been, yeah. I've been grouped and coached like all of my life. My, my lovely bride, she's been a part of the, the Army all of her life, you know, for the most part. And we have two beautiful granddaughters, and I'm a pet owner. But most people, when they look at the name Beagle, the assumption they make is that I own a Beagle. And I said, no, we own a Chihuahua, right? <laughs> Key difference. So I, I have no shame yeah, in my yeah. game walking around the neighborhood with my little Chihuahua. And, um, you know, so that that is kind of me in a nutshell. I joined in 1990. Uh, to South Carolina State, where we've produced 22 general officers from that, that one small school in South Carolina, which, which is which is great and phenomenal. And I thought I was going to have a career in sports at some point, but that didn't work out. But the, the the closest thing and the best comparison, and even better, the team of teams is the Army. And I will say that you know all day. So I ended up not being on you know some professional team, but I'm on the best team you know out there in our nation. Awesome. You know, you talked about your, your kids and your grandkids. I have uh, four and went on the way five great grandbabies. So, you know, wow. you know I'm, I know I'm getting all there. I for sure I love them. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, Sergeant Major, tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Oh, I appreciate it, SMA. Sir, that's great. Hey, I always used to start this thing off and say, and say hey, I'm just like a surfer skateboard kid from California who really wanted to be in the Army, surprisingly, right? But but that, you know, that's sort of a, a funny thing, but it, but it's uh, it's not enough, right? I, I think what's really important is 
I knew at a very young age that I wanted to be a soldier. My dad was in the Army, Vietnam era, um, so I had some exposure. But I grew up in, in Southern California where he where he settled. And uh, I was that kid running around in the hills playing guns with my buddies, you know, playing Army all the time. And I knew pretty early my 130-pound self wasn't going to be a, a sports athlete. Um, but I knew that I wanted to be uh, in with an organization or with people, like-minded people, uh, tackling uh, hard things. I just always knew I wanted to be to do something like that. So uh, I joined the Army when I was 17. I graduated early, uh, joined the Army when I was 17, went to Airborne School, went to the 82nd, and, and really just had a, an interesting career. Along the way, you know, I've had a couple of kids, uh, one, one of which is a my daughter is a civil engineer. She's 24, very proud of her. She's doing great. Ooh. And my son, he just uh, moved into his dorm room at Middle Tennessee State University. He wants to be an audio engineer. So if you got a, if you got an internship there at the podcast, he may be looking for something, you know, in a few years uh, as, a, as an audio engineer, audio production. Job plug, well, we, got right? some, hey, we got some guys down here probably could help him out. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so my wife, she's on active duty. She's a, uh, she used to be an aviator. She's now an Army dietitian. So she came back into the army when we started the H2F program. She was completely dedicated to, uh, you know, soldier lifestyle, soldier health, and just absolutely had a calling to come back and uh, was selected to come back and be a part of that. And she's doing fantastic work with the first infantry division and their combat aviation brigade as their dietitian. So uh, she's, she's there at Fort Riley. I'm here in Fort Leavenworth, but we make it work. It's that, you know, that's that dual military, modern army family lifestyle. We yeah. love it. I, I, yeah, I would tell you that. I tell people all the time, you know, once you're in the Army, you got a family for life. You know, it doesn't matter if I haven't talked to you for 25 years. I call you up on the phone. It's like, a, it's like I talked to you yesterday. And it's just, it's a wonderful feeling to, uh, to, to have people that really care so much. And I get the other thing is really important. You have people that walked in your boots, that know how you feel, that know how you think about life, and, and certainly, quite frankly, love this country and want to do everything they can. I, I can say one thing for I ask you, the first question is, what's important for the people that listen today, uh, these two leaders right here, raise their hand, says, I'll protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. And I want, everybody knows this, but I'm going to tell you because I, I think it's important. They're willing to die for your freedoms, and they train people to make sure our leaders are going in the right direction so they can train our young soldiers that are that are on the battlefield and they've been on the battlefield so this is a this is an important discussion for all of us sir the combined arms center has a long history and referred to as the intellectual center of the army and it touches almost every sector of the army would you would you talk about that and you talk about that and your mission yeah no and you're absolutely right so we have the long-standing reputation of being the intellectual center of our army and i don't think and i've talked to all of my you know, predecessors for the most part, a large majority of them, I think they'll all tell you it's not because of who's sitting in the seat as, as the commander out here. It's because of the great team that you're around, you know, with our soldiers, yeah. officers, NCOs, Army civilian professionals, you know, on this team and what we do and what we touch. And one of them told me, he said, everything that happens in our Army lands in the Combined Arms Center inbox. And most people don't know that because we touch everything that deals with training and education across our force. And when you add in the power of the centers of excellence, and it's 11 of those across our country, you know, from the East Coast all the way to the West Coast that touch every soldier, regardless of rank, you know, throughout the different schools and functional courses that we have that we run, you know, and on behalf of TRADOC. The one beauty of being here at Leavenworth is the other subordinate organizations that we have here that, again, reinforces the point that we touch everything across our Army. And you think Army University, when I, I got the you know the selected for the job here, SMA, one thing I'll tell you, I had no idea ever that I would be considered the vice chancellor of a university. But <laughs> I, that is also one yeah. of my titles. You That's know, a here, great title. Here at CAC, I, I still haven't quite figured out what that means yet, uh, but Army University, <laughs> you know, most everybody in our Army knows what that means in terms of the, every year, you know, up to 1,200 majors come through. I mean, our iron majors in the Army for Command and General Staff College. I mean, every battalion commander, sergeant major, army civilian professionals that, that will take command in the army, they come through here for their pre-command courses and, and our senior leaders come seven times a year. That's how important that leader development aspect is, you know, for our army that you'll have all of your four stars and their sergeant majors come here seven times a year. It, it's phenomenal. Our combined arms center for training. We touch everything from CTCs, training aids, devices, you name it. It's, it's, we touch 
pretty much everything as well as our you know mission command center of excellence I mean, so all those things when we think about you know c2 you think about um, the different dynamics with regard to leadership and leadership development Mission Command Center of Excellence, it falls right there. And of course, you know, your beloved uh, Sergeant Majors Academy and the NCO Leader Center of Excellence, you know, all fall underneath CAC. And then we work directly for TRADOC and a lot of support in the Futures Command. And most people don't know that we have a foot every day in the field force and we have a foot in the future force. So we're working constantly between what we do currently and what we're going to do in the future in support of two major commands. And I'll, I'll stop there for a second, but I can talk. On and on. No, no, I, I'm going to ask Sergeant Major, but before I, I got one question for you. Technology changes so fast. And how do you stay abreast of the changes with technology and make sure that uh, our future leaders, you talk about future, you know, future development stuff in the military, but how do we stay ahead of that, that constant chain of technology and equipment? You may want to answer. Can you answer that, I guess? You want me to answer that? Or is uh, that well, to CG, yeah, let's CG answer. Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. So that, that's that connection with Futures Command. So is we set right at that nexus, right at that crossroad between the two commands and that future and, and where we are currently. And so we, we always have a good read, you know, what's coming, you know, through concepts. What is Futures Command looking at as the next thing? Most of that is a material solution or a thing when you think yeah. about it that way. But we also hear we have the Center for Army Lessons Learned. So as you're seeing things unfold every day, Russia, Ukraine, whether it be Israel, you know, what they're doing, IDF uh, and Hamas, or, you know, things from the past, you know, going to car about any previous war. So we always have a good fingertip feel, if you look at it that way, from, you know, what we can gain from what Futures Command is doing, and as well as others through experimentation or CTC rotations, and then what we're learning, truly learning from what is going on currently. So we, we sit at a perfect spot to bring that in, to keep ourselves at pace with change technology, because it's going to be factored in with futures, but that's going to come back to us to integrate across our army. Yeah. So, Sergeant Major, I'm going to ask you, but I'm going, to, I'm going to caveat just a little bit. You know, when I was talking about changes, when I know when I was currently in the army so long ago, now I almost can't remember, but but uh, I always had a difficult time about, you know, we get changes. We talk, you talk about Vietnam, you talk about Ukraine, you talk about all these deployments, and sometimes it's hard to implement all that stuff uh, into the educational system and the trade and stuff. So, Sergeant Major, what are some of the most challenges, uh, things that you that you really focus on during the day or during the month or during the year? I'm, I'm sure you say focus on a lot of stuff. Uh, it depend, I, I think it depends on the topic, but uh, you know, the topic we're currently on, if you, if you related that to implementing those changes into, into NCO and soldier PME and training, that's, that's a heck of a challenge. When you talk total army, we're, yeah, as we all well know, it's, it's a million people. It's a million person organization across um, the total army. And at scale, when we're trying to change the way that we train, leader develop, and educate soldiers, NCOs, and leaders of, of all cohorts, um, that, that's a tough challenge. And from an NCO perspective, I'm in the mix uh, with, our, with our COEs, our NCO academies, NUCLECO, probably every day um, with a lot of oversight and guidance from our trade doc CSM, who's doing a lot of great work to reinvigorate, renew, uh, adapt, change, and modernize uh, multiple aspects of our, of our education system and our training uh, at COEs and, and really training, at least building the framework for training for our partners in, in the Forces Command. Yeah, I, I got to ask you another question too. This is always I'm sure. always talking to people about this. You know what? I always thought when we was in a war, we was in a war for a long time, over 20 years, I think it was, and I, and we pulled people out of school, and and we wasn't, uh, and we shortened things up, and and so the, the development phase of our of our junior leaders. Do you think that was affected by by uh, by war, and how was it affected by the war? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. We could probably spend the rest of the podcast yeah. talking no, about no, that. No, just make it a short answer. Just a, <laughs> no, go ahead. But I think, I, but I think it was, and I know that's that's probably one well, of the I, things that you struggle with all the time. I do, and I don't, SMA. I mean, to be honest, I think where we found efficiencies, we needed to. I mean, we we were at war, um, and I think there was some some experiential learning that was going on within our NCO core that was resonant in our operating forces uh, that was pretty powerful. I think the struggle now is trying to reinvigorate some of those things from an educational perspective as we talk about large scale combat operations and what that means to the you know the professional trainers of our army the non commissioned officers and our soldiers who execute missions they got to understand you know the challenges and risks associated 
with what happens in that kind of warfare. Um, and then we have to do a good job or a better job of reinvigorating some of those fundamental skills and tasks at the right echelon that we may have been able to based off of a, of a wartime footing army that was very experienced in that type of warfare. Uh, we, you know, we found some efficiencies in, in, in moving away from some of those things. And now it seems like it happened pretty fast. If you yeah. look around at those folks, you know, there's not combat patch wearing, you know, leaders in a lot of these formations anymore. And that's okay because we're building the future now. Yeah. The only yeah. reason I said that because, you know, I, you guys know I, I was in Vietnam a long time ago. Coming out of Vietnam, we had to rebuild the non-commissioned officer. Uh, and the officer, we had, we really struggled for quite a few years going back to the basic fundamentals of development, leadership development, all the rest of that stuff. So I know that's a struggle. It takes you a while to, to move, uh, move through all that stuff. And it's not just an NCO problem. It's an officer and an NCO problem. So it's, it's both of you working there. Sir, we spoke about leader development. That's something for us to jump on right now. Uh, that's a major focus at CAC. Why is that so important? We probably just answered why that's so important for today, especially today's Army. Yeah, SMA, and I want to go back to your other question too, real quick. Yeah, yeah. The question in front of me right now. Um, you know, we have many competitive advantages in our army, but but that is the the most you know prevalent you know competitive advantage that we have is our leader development, how we do it. It is the one thing you know that nobody else can steal on a thumb drive from our army. I mean, they just can't from the U.S. Army. They can duplicate it all day, but they can't replicate you know what we do and how we have that laid out. And I think it matches a little bit about your previous question, you know, and we can always look back and second guess, did we get it right? Did we pull too much out? Did we move anything around? But I think we sometimes miss the beauty of how our army is designed, especially yeah. if we look at our major commands. And, and I'll go back and read, you know, a lot of history. And the one thing when they when they brought about Forcecom and Tradoc at the same time, you know, back in the 70s, the thing that we we kind of miss today is there's a division of labor between those two. So we can pull things out, you know, again, because you're at war out of the, the training pipeline out of, you know, the institutional PME, but then that balance shifts a little bit to, you know, the force because you're learning in real time. It's very difficult to keep up with that speed, but if you're at a point where we are now, then you can rebalance, right? That division of labor kind of shifts back. We have a little bit more time. Things are playing. We're not, you know, necessarily in the fight like we were the last couple of decades, so we always have to be mindful of that balance between the two. And oh, by the way, that third pillar of self-development, that is a wheel that keeps on rolling. So, I mean, each individual has a you know part in their own development, you know, whether they're sitting in, you know, a force comm unit or a trade doc unit, your self-development, regardless of where you're sitting, you have to keep that churning. And you know, the way we look at leader development, you know, here across the board and link to you know our documents about the the skills and the knowledge every leader has to have, regardless of level, from BLC all the way up to you know the war college, even though that doesn't fall you know in our wheelhouse, but we're closely connected. I mean it's all the way through. The, the other point, you think about our attributes and competencies. You know, we brought back, you know, be no do, right? So the attributes are to be in the know. Here's things that you, you got to have. But when it comes to the competencies, what is it you got to do? This is what you have to do. So lead, achieve, and develop. Those three things for every leader. And I think, you know, from a simple perspective, our own leader requirements model, if you if you internalize that, it's fairly easy. You mean, be no do, I mean, it's great. Just like we brought back, be all you can be. I mean, yeah. some things are, are very simple. You don't need to overcomplicate them, but you know when you look at those pillars, what are you going to learn? You know when you're in the operating force, what are you going to learn when you're you know on the institutional side of it? But then what are you doing day in day out to improve to make yourself better? It, it all ties together pretty neat, and so we we have a beautiful system, and it's not just the CAC system. I mean our Army system is beautiful in terms of how we develop leaders, and nobody can you know du they can duplicate it, but they can't replicate it. Yeah, I'd say just one thing real quick. Focus on the basics, the basic fundamentals, and that's really the foundation of a lot of stuff. Sometimes we get away. We're looking up here where we should be looking down here to yeah. sort of start that building that building phase. Sergeant Major, you want to add? This is a great discussion. I love it. I love this so much. You want to add anything? Well, you know, you said it. I mean, the, I don't want to. I don't want to over oversimplify you know, and start to majorize it and say, hey, you know, like like the SMA's got the quote, "Be brilliant at the basics," but. But really, if you think about it, I think I heard General Rainey say this. If you if you put it into the context of modernization, futures command, a tech technology-based army, one thing that he said that really caught my attention as I thought about how we train and develop our soldiers and NCOs is he said, unprepared units will be punished by technology. I'm not sure the exact quote, I'm paraphrasing there, 
But yeah. I think that's a really powerful message. You can have all the G Wiz gadgets and the latest uh, modern classrooms and, and instruction and AI. But at the end of the day, if your organization at the small unit level is not fundamentally skilled, all that tech is just going to punish you in combat. It's going to actually be detrimental to you in combat because you're not going to have the fundamental skill sets to be able to capitalize on it. So we got to build those strong foundational organizations, strong in the foundations, because as we add new kit, we add new capability and we change the way we're going to fight. It's those fundamentally skilled units that are going to be able to quick on the uptake and adaptive on the battlefield. Yo, yo, go ahead. Yeah, I love that. I mean, that's exactly what uh, what we need to do. I, I, you guys got me so pumped up. I think I'm yeah, I'm hovering in this chair right now. Practice, I'm like, hey, I'll, I'll take that. Well, I'm done for the day. <laughs> <laughs> hey, one of, one of Cat's main mission is driving change to create a multi-domain operation capable of by 2030. I'd like to talk about that, but there's always a but to everything we do. But before we do that, we're going to take a quick break. Then, so stay right there. We'll be right back. This is your next mission video podcast with me, your host, Jack L. Tilly, 12th Sergeant Major of the Army. If you're enjoying this discussion, if you aren't, something's wrong with you, please like us. Click on that subscribe button below. Also, click on the bell next to the subscribe button to receive notifications of all of our upcoming video podcasts. I'll be right back after this word from our presenting sponsors. You're watching Your Next Mission video podcast, proudly presented by Navy Federal Credit Union, the most trusted credit union owned by members of the military community, serving all branches of the armed forces and their families. Their members are the mission. Learn more at NavyFederal.org. And Purdue Global. You're ready for a comeback, and with Purdue Global, you can do more than take classes. You can take charge of your story, of your career, of your life. Earn a degree you can be proud of and get an education employer's respect. Start your comeback at purdueglobal.edu. Now back to your host, the 12th Sergeant Major of the Army, Jack L. Tilly. We're talking with Lieutenant General Milford H. Beagle, Jr., Commanding General and CSM Stephen H. Helton, Command Sergeant Major of the United States Army Combined Arms Center. Sir, let's, let's talk about CAT, drives change to create a multi-domain operation capable by 2030. Would you talk about that a little bit with us, sir? Yeah, and, and one thing we have SMA as part of our motto is drive change forward victory. We always have to keep that mindful. And I'll just give you kind of the short story of it and, you know, and how are we getting there and what does that really mean when you hear Army of 2030, Army of 2040. It, it sometimes confuses people, but it really started, you know, back in 2019 and, and actually even before the last couple of you know decades of war, because we were being observed by all of our potential adversaries and adversaries out there watching what we we're doing. We were that, you know, person in the ring, you know, so to speak. But one thing, you know, and leaders here at CAC, TRADOC, and across our force wanted to figure out where do we have gaps? So now we're fighting a certain way in COIN, counterinsurgency operations. But if we were to go large scale, because look at, you know, what happened in Russia, you know, the first incursion into the Ukraine, look at other things that happened around the globe. We've got to be ready to fight at large scale. So the perspective was, where do we have gaps if we had to really fight at large scale? And you know, over 300 gaps were identified across our army because of how we organized over the last couple of decades and how we were fighting, all okay for coin, but now look at it in a bigger perspective. And so with the gaps, we're reduced to what are the priority gaps? No kidding. What will cause our army to lose our first battles? What would cause us to culminate? So it was distilled you know, with the chief's guidance uh, Joe Milley at the time in the 17 gaps. To give you an example of what a gap is, uh, one, for example, is we would be black on fuel at LD. And you're like, what does that mean? If you put every division, every core out in a large scale context, think Europe as one example, and had to fuel it, and you, and you know the deal with all the tanks, Bradley's, wheel vehicles, yeah. et cetera, we wouldn't have enough fuel. We wouldn't have enough capacity, you know, one, to move it around to carry it. So that's a huge gap if we're fighting at LISCO. So that's an example of what some of the gaps were. And by looking at that, we said, okay, now look at time. How long would that take us? I mean, we're going to need to take some time to convert ourselves, adjust at echelon to get there. And the initial perspective was, well, we'll have an aim point and a waypoint, waypoint, aim point. But that didn't resonate. And it's like, okay, what, what is the waypoint? What is the aim point? So it was fixed in terms of time related to time, 2030 and 2040. How do we need to look by 2030? And there's some things that we know from some of our adversaries 
like the PRC, you know, People's Republic, Republic of China, as one example, there's things they publicly stated. So I'm not telling, you know, any secrets. You can Google yeah. search it, look it up, and they'll tell you where they're going to be in time. So now kind of comparing ourselves, you know, in that sense of time, where do we need to be, you know, at certain points? So that's how you got the big markers out there. But fundamentally, what I would say about, you know, 2030, it's about organizational change. And a lot of new solutions will come in, you know, to our army. You think capabilities like the big five, when those came into being, you know, those things will come to fruition, you know, from now through 2030 and on into 2040. And how do we integrate those into the force? But our major role at CAC, and this is why we touch everything, we don't deal as much with, the solutions that come out, the material things. I mean, that is primarily Futures Command and, and ASOL. But what we do is how do we integrate all that? So, it, it, you know, the way we make things real, I'll throw another acronym, but I'll explain it for the audience. You you know it very well, but it's dot mil PFP. So doctrine, organization, training, new development, education, and the material piece, uh, personnel, facilities, and policy. So we do that. We have everything with the exception of the M, we call it the little M because we're trying to integrate across all those. How do we update the doctrine? What do the organization design looks like based on the piece of kit that we're going to bring into our army? How do we do the leader development, the training, the education? That is where we fall dead center, you know, on behalf of TRADOC to work all that, to, to get a good solution, a true full solution out the other end. And so when it comes to 2030, It'll be a, a revolving door of change, you know, over time. We're not going to just flip the army upside down overnight, but through all of our compos. I mean, compo one, two, and three, National Guard and Reserve, you know, we've got to integrate them in. So we're going to look different. We're going to operate different for sure because we have a new operating concept, as you know, multi-domain operations, published the latest doctrine back in October, uh, not this past October, but the previous October rollout at AUSA, the Association of the United States Army, and, and that's where, you know, we've got to take this time that we have now to drive that into our formation, what we do at our combat training centers, what we do at, in PME and the schoolhouses for professional military education and how home station training is done. That is our way of working gradually towards the Army of 2030, which will give us, you know, that, that, that point in time where we have the right landing spots because we, Futures Command, hadn't really figured out what 2040 what that army would look like, which General Rainey at any point in time will tell you, that'll be an army that will be, you know, fundamentally drastically different than what we know now, given capabilities, how we truly train, integration of technology, integration of things like human machine integration, AI integration, all those things. But we're just creating that landing spot at about 2030 to make sure we, we made the right adjustments to pull all that in, even at a faster pace. Yeah, you know, no, no. It's uh, one I tell people this all the time. When I came in the army, years, way a lot of years before you guys went in the army, I came in at '66, and and got out in 2000. Uh, in 2000, so so change is part of my life, and change is part of the army. Uh, the other thing I'll tell you too is where you think you're going to fight, you're not going to fight. You know, <laughs> where you think I'm going to go. This is what I'm trying. Well, that's not going to happen. You have to be ready to fight every war. And that's what yeah. they make it, I mean, everywhere, because you never know where you're going to be fighting. Sergeant Major, you want, oh, this is a great discussion. Do you want to add anything to what the general said? Well, I mean, I, I think I think you really said Okay. Uh, <laughs> that's I, good. Yeah, I don't want to just foot stomp, but, but they're, you know. I, no, I got you. I get, ones, nope. That's good. I can't yeah, say well, it better. Yeah, well, no, no, well, well, you, well, you covered all the information. It's important for us to tell our audience exactly what you yeah. guys are doing as a, as a team to make sure that we're ready to do exactly what we need on, to do in the battlefield. But I do have another question. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the CAC maintains the warfighting doctrine and tactics, you know, in the world? And it's really constant change. Can you tell me what you're doing about doctrine and tactics? Yeah, before I do that, SMA, one thing yeah, you, you said, when, when you came in the Army, so I'm not going to tell you when I was born. <laughs> So no, 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 don't, don't even say, don't even bring not, that up. Don't bring that up. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. Uh, <laughs> you, you make you make crazy. You spill the beans for him. Not, that's not me. Uh, I'm a little bit older. Uh, I just don't look like it. We, we look about the same. <laughs> um, but, but you did make a point. You know, and it's a, it's a great point because, I mean, when, you know, back in the 70s when they used leverage the Big Five and designed the Army, you know, for, you know, that European, you know, essentially large scale fight. Yeah. That's not what it was used for. I mean, right. we found it in, you know, places like Iraq and Panama. So to your point, we've got to be able to do still a lot of things that our nation needs us to do. And they're never going to ask us if we're ready. It's just going to be an expectation. That, but 
That's a good point. Now, yeah, but I'm gonna, well, I got to add something to what you just said. One of the things that really always bothers me is that uh, we get ready to fight, and, and we and we get all uh, we have all the uh, we don't have the money to get ready to prepare ourselves to fight. Sometimes, you know, maybe it's a little bit different now. It used to bother me, but we have all the time. We just don't have the money to train. And then when a war comes, we got all the money, and you just don't have time to train. We just go into war with what we have, and it's it's uh, it's probably, I'm sure it's the same way now. My probably a little bit mind more. Uh, go back to your same question, there, Sergeant Major. Uh, uh, war fighting doctrine just, tactics. Can you tell us? Yeah. Uh, so really, on the previous thing, I mean, that just spurred a thought. As we transition the army towards 2030, I think what I observe, you know, because that's what that's kind of what I do is I spend a lot of time out with the operating force at our COEs, at the NCO academies, out at training, to see the effects. What I think is happening, this is my opinion, my observation, given the context that General Beagle just laid out, is, you know, we've always said this in the Army, as I, as I was growing up in the Army, hey, Sergeant, hey, Sergeant Helton, the risk is in transition, right? And that was even small transitions of operations, transition of tactical operations, even small squad team operations. It's always in the transition is where the risk is highest. And I think at the at the army level, in the context that we were just talking about, towards 2030, we're in an army in transition, right? So I think what I see is that they feel the they feel the squeeze at at the tactical edge. I think units feel you talk, you hit on it earlier too, where we're out in the units, you know, they don't always receive these things the way that we intend them to, and it no. just seems like oh, one more thing. Well, what I'll tell you is we definitely know about that. We definitely understand that, and I think we do a as good a job as we can to make sure that we communicate that to leaders all the way down to the tactical level, that they understand, hey, look, there's a lot of change that's come. There's a lot of things that are driving this. We spent a lot of time talking that at PCC um, and, and help them understand we are an army in transition. So it doesn't just feel like they're inundated with, you know, the pile on of new requirements for this or that. And then we can focus on war fighting. Hey, what you got is what you got for now. Be able to fight it. And then, and then we'll be in a better place. So yeah. it's just we, we, yeah, no, no. That, I think the, the other thing I always like to tell people: there's no second best in our profession. Yeah, I, right. I have to be ready to fight. I mean, it's you know, I can joke and laugh and, and kid with people and do all that stuff. But the bottom line is, you paid me. This country is paying me to protect them. So I'm willing to die for your freedoms. And and I think it's important that we understand: I, I'm not second to nobody, and I'm going to be ready to do exactly what my country calls me to do. Yeah, no, absolutely. Which is, you know, to my point about it's an expectation. Our nation will expect us to be ready. That they're not going to ask the question. They sleep easy at night because they they know we're ready. And even if the resources don't line up, I mean, exactly to your point, not a lot has changed. As in pages, so, no, you know, <laughs> I, I uh, didn't think of that. Yeah, no, it, it never really balances out. But I mean, I forget who said it. Uh, we will have to go back and footnote it later. But I mean, you know, if we're out of resources, I mean, now we have to think. If we're out of money, now we have to think. Thinking is free. So yeah, again, that, that's what goes into it as well as figuring out, you know, innovative, creative ways to do things. We can simply do that, you know, with a lot of great thinking. And we have, you know, great teams and great professionals, you know, in our army to, to do that. And it's a matter of you can wring your hands and roll up your sleeves, but you can't do both at the same time. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I challenge you to, to dare your next guest to do that and just watch him fumble around. It's like you're going to do one or the other. <laughs> and, and whether we have the resources or not, I mean, to your point, we're, we're going to do what our nation needs us to do. That, and that's just the beauty of you know, our whole system. I mean, how we develop leaders, everything that we've been been talking about. And, and to bridge that into your point about doctrine, you know, it's our common language. It's our common perspective and philosophy of how we do things. And we have that as well. The combined arms, you know, doctrine directorate, you know, they, they do all the doctrine development. And there's a lot of it out there. Some people may think it's, it's too much, uh, but, but it's about the right amount because we've got to cover, you know, very big overarching things. And we got to cover all the way down to techniques. I mean, how do we do? How do we fight? And and mostly, you know, when you look into our doctrine, it's about how do we fight with what we have. Don't worry yep. about what we don't have yet, because readiness is about what we have, and that's what our doctrine tells us. How do we fight? How do we operate with what we have, like right now, and a little bit into the future, not a whole lot, but a little bit. And we have to fill in some gaps there. And so the way we really, you know, keep up the speed, keep up the pace, you know, with with the change of everything that's going on is is through the ingest ingestion of you know, those lessons learned that come in, things that we're seeing, that gets folded into doctrine. It's our CTC, those combat training center, you know, rotations and exercises, experimentation is done. All those things that we just reach out and grab to pull into doctrine. And the good thing about it, you know, across our army, 
is crowdsourced in the sense of everybody's going to see those versions of here's what we're looking at for the doctrine. Does this make sense? Can you get your arms around? Does this make sense for your formation across the board? And we get that feedback and produce it as quick as we can. The thing I love about the combined arms doctrine directive, the one thing they say is you can have speed, you can have quality, you can have quantity when it comes to doctrine, but you can only pick two. And that, that point is exactly right. So we can make it fast, but it might not be very good. Uh, yeah. But you know, People normally complain, our soldiers uh, normally complain about, well, doctrine is a little bit too slow. Well, it's not designed to cover everything. It, it is from a perspective of, it's the philosophy, and never confuse the philosophy with the playbook. I mean, the playbook is what you're going to develop down at the unit level. Your SOPs, seeing things on the fly, feed that back in. That helps us iterate, but never confuse those two. We're not writing playbooks. We're laying out the philosophy of how we're going to do this, which gives us that common language, that common perspective as a profession you know i am so pumped up right now i tell you what if you could see my feet under this desk i'm running 300 <laughs> miles an hour yeah, and we have a lot more there you go. Happy we got a lot happy. more to talk about we got a lot more that you guys got me so hey uh, but it's a great conversation and the people that are listening i want you to understand something I, i'm an american soldier i'm willing to die for your freedoms i want you to understand that these men are the people in the military or allow us to be free each day and, and so it's, it's something to look at. It's a great profession. It's something I'm, I'm proud to say I serve it, and I'm still serving, only a different capacity. We have a lot more to talk about, but first, there's always a but first. It's time for another quick commercial, so stay right there. We'll be right back. Now, here's a word from two more of the organizations who make this show possible. You're watching Your Next Mission video podcast, brought to you in part by Blue Cross Blue Shield FEP Dental, Blue Cross Blue Shield FEP Vision. Part of transitioning out is that dental and vision insurance breaks off from your medical insurance. Vision and dental is very important to be able to enjoy your retirement. Blue Cross Blue Shield makes the transition so much easier. And USAA. A promise is a trust not to be broken. Whether spoken with an oath or sealed with a pinky. And after 100 years, we're still taking care of the military community and their families. That's our mission, always. Now back to your host, the 12th Sergeant Major of the Army, Jack L. Tilly. Welcome back. We're blessed to be here today with the Combined Arms Center Command Team, Lieutenant General Milford H. Beagle, Jr., Commanding General, and CFM Stephen H. Helton, Command Sergeant Major. I want all of our viewers to reach out to me directly. Tell me about your transition. Tell me what topics you'd like to cover on the show. Remember, Rich, it's your show. It's not my show. You can call or text me at 844-424-1134, or I'll reach out to you. Or send me an email at smatilly at yournextmission.org. Sir, Sergeant Major, we're heading into your final, uh, with, to our final segment with you guys today, and I hope you've enjoyed it just as much as I have. I just have a, just have a couple more questions, and this is a, a great question for, for all of you. Sir, recruiting and retention has been a hot button topic over the past couple of years. What would you say, or would you like to say, to the soldiers who may be you know, undecided about continuing their time in the, in the military in their career? Yeah, I'll, Sergeant Major, I'll let you jump on it first. Okay. So, so do you want to talk about continuing to serve, or would yeah, you like continue, to serve? absolutely. But in fact, I'd like you to talk about both of them: continuing to yeah. serve and why should they serve? I, so, you know, look as, as far as continuing to serve, I can I can talk about why I continue to serve, uh, and maybe that will be helpful. And and really, it was about you know the person to my right in this case, people to my left and right. It, the reason I continue to serve is not the same reasons that I joined the army, right? So I think yeah. there's a there's a period of time in, in the service, probably any service, where it really becomes about your battle buddy left and right, um, and the team that you're a part of, and the team of high performing, hardworking, like minded individuals who just want to solve problems together, um, and, and you just build great friendships and family over time, and, and that's really what what kept me going was the people, but the challenge of the job also, you know, at every echelon, I always felt like 
I am not ready for this. You know, as a, as a young platoon sergeant, I am not ready for this. And and the challenge, you know, that's my internal monologue. You know, my external uh, was was, hey, I'm getting after it. Take my platoon. We're going to do great training. And, but at each echelon, I felt like, man, am I ready for this? And that challenge, that internal monologue, that challenge of of doing something for the organization and for your soldiers that's bigger than yourself, that's about something bigger than yourself, has been incredibly rewarding over the years. And so the drive to continue to to educate myself and to to self-study and to spend time with soldiers and to counsel and mentor. Like these are the things that continue to drive you, I think, beyond what some might consider a normal term of service. Um, and, and maybe that's not for everybody. That was certainly it for me. Yeah, well, I, th I think at some point in your, in your military career, I I'm not sure when it's different for everybody, a button turns on. Something turns on that changes you. You know, it's always about, I was going to ask you this question in a minute, but it's, yeah. always, about, it's always about people first and how important it is to take right. care of your soldiers. And really, it's not, you know, it's everybody. You know, you got to take care of the people around you, the people above you and below you. But it's all about taking care of each other. And sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes it's, uh, sometimes it's hard, but you got to be honest and fair with them. So talk about people first a little bit there before we go into the next question. You want to talk about, well, you just talked about a little bit of it. Well, I did want to just say one thing, because I, I don't know if I've ever said it out loud. I'm sort of workshopping this idea. But this seems like a great, look, here's how I look at this. From, from a position of joining the military, right? So the great thing about, uh, in my case, the Army, is it doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter where you started. The Army, for me, is transformation, right? It puts you on a trajectory, should you choose, that's different than the one you might have started on. I'll just say Absolutely, that. Absolutely, yeah. But but not only that, the, I don't know of another profession that you that you join that is generationally transformational as fast as the army is. So I would say that no matter where I started, you know, I obviously have benefited from, from the military. I'm on a trajectory that, that's fantastic. But my kids, one generation later, my kids have not had to be concerned about anything except their achievement, right? So, so the stability, the, um, you know, it's a challenge, but the stability, the, the financial stability, the, the belief uh, that they can be anything is is truly embedded within our children. So in one generation, the potential for for uh, exceptional uh, achievement is is greatly increased. I mean, there's some great examples. You look at um, you know uh, General Brunson, whose father was a sergeant major uh, back back in the day, and now he's a three star general. I mean, it's just a great sort of example in one generation how fast. Of it changes the trajectory from a family perspective. Just a thought. No, no, that's a great thought. You know, you really, there's something I was going to ask you about, you know, you, and you touched on it right now, the importance of quality of life initiative for soldiers right. and families. I mean, that's, that's really the key to success in the military. If you take care of those soldiers and their families, they'll stay with you forever. And, and we struggle sometimes with, with things that are going on, especially with the deployments and family separations and stuff. But uh, that's, that's tough. That's really tough. Sir, you've spoken on, and really on a lot of social media about the importance of a, the modern leader having the data and the literacy skills. Can you discuss why these skills are so important for leaders and how they might help a soldier after they leave the military? Yeah, I mean, one one thing yesterday me with that is, I mean, we swim in data every day. We we don't even know it. I mean, we we deal with you know our iPhones or Android phones, whatever the case may be. And those things have more power than than the old space shuttle. And so, and whatever we interact with, whatever app, we're we're dealing in data all the time. And it does go back to the point, sorry, Major made earlier. I mean, we don't want to be punished by technology on the battlefield at some point. When it comes to data literacy. You know, it's not that everybody needs to know everything. We're not trying to make or not. The goal is not to make every soldier, you know, an NCO, a data scientist or, you know, an expert in data analytics. But everybody needs to know something. And when it comes to, you know, data and analytics, I mean, we got to understand how to, to read it, how to work with it, how to analyze it, and how to communicate it. That's fundamentally what it boils down to, you know, at the end of the day. And, and to my earlier point about, you know, everybody doesn't need everything. So there's a ubiquitous you know, aspect to it. Everybody needs something because we're, we're dealing with it all the time. And in some cases, we don't even know it. There's a way we need to specialize it because you're going to have a few that need more. We're going to need those specialists that really know how to dig into it 
so we can make decisions. I mean, that's part of it for commanders and leaders is how do you use all this data that we're swimming in day in and day out, even on the battlefield to help you make decisions. So it's not so much, you know, data driven decisions. I mean, it's really, to me, my personal view, kind of laying things out. I mean, data's not going to drive anything. It's going to inform. I mean, data informed decisions. So we got the power to do it. When you think AI, all the technology out there, it's going to allow me as, as a commander to make better informed decisions. And that's all the way, you know, down the chain. So we're educating on that, you know, throughout all of our professional military education on the institutional side. Ideally, the goal is even to get it to the basic training level from that point all the way through your higher points of education. So they understand even at that simple you know, level, fundamental understanding, you've got to have it there because as long as they stay in, it's going to grow. It's going to be more out there in terms of data that they have to understand how to do some of the basic analytics. What does this mean? And what do I do with it? And how could this help me? So I think it is fundamentally key across the board how we further educate, incorporate, you know, data analytics, understanding technology into everything that we do. Yeah, you know, one of the things about it is, is you get disconnected. At the senior level, you get disconnected. If you don't know how to communicate with everybody and change is part of life. And I was sitting there thinking as you was talking that I have 12,000 people that follow me on LinkedIn and I'm going to try to get that to 30,000. But uh-huh. uh and about six or seven thousand on Facebook, so that's a, you know it's a big group of people, and of course we have people that help me connect. But but that's how you talk and communicate with the younger adults and find out what the issues are. Sergeant Major, you want to add anything? Yeah, yeah. before yeah, go ahead, no, go ahead I, sir. So, no, no, no. And, I, and I think I misread the question a little bit, but you know it is it's, it's how you inform. I mean, it, it's yeah, about right. the information. So we also we, we swim in you know a world full of information, and part of our definition, our army definition, which is a great one. You know, it is about influence. I mean, influencing people to achieve a mission by providing purpose, direction, and motivation. Yeah. But that first part being influence. And so you can do that physically, but now in the information space, you have to do it there. Sure. And whether or not you, you want to be in it, I'm pretty sure uh, you, like me, I've got a lot of imposters out there, but you've got to own that space. And so yep. every leader, I think, is is in that space, whether they want to be or not. And you and I both probably heard it. I don't want to deal with that social media stuff. I mean, a lot of badness. Well, it's your space though. And you've got to own your space and your territory. And it is a way to communicate, but also influence, which is, you know, why I'm there. I mean, I've got a whole team that beats back imposters all day long, but you know, I'm going to keep, you know, influence and informing those that I'm connected to. And within a certain sphere of influence, you know, doing it for positive. And that's the key thing. And part of what we have to do, whether it's physically or, you know, through the information space, because all of our people are there and, and you got to meet them where they are. And if they're in information space, if it, as a leader, you might want to go meet them where they're at in that space. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's, it's funny you funny to say that because I gave a briefing here a couple of months ago and there was a, a general officer that said, and I said about social media and all that other stuff. And it was a female. She quickly said, no, no, no. Be careful about that social media. I said, well, if you don't communicate on social media nowadays, you're not going to communicate. So I made you want to add anything. No, I, I, thought, I thought that was fantastic. In fact, in fact, there was a couple of things, you know, you probably saw me point because I, I had, that was what I, Almost the is same he looking way. at your notes? Is that what he's doing? Looking at your uh, notes, answering your right. question? <laughs> no, 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 it's all, it was, um, it's mind meld. Uh, but look, he, number one, SMA, you're a great example for all of us. You, you're out here, you're getting after it, you're doing it. You're, in, you're doing what we hear a lot of our senior NCOs say they have concerns about. Go meeting, meeting people where they're at. But, but the Army, as we all know, is it's a human endeavor. War fighting is a human endeavor. And if the humans are in this space and you want to talk to them, you've got to figure out how that works for you. I think our senior NCOs and our sergeant majors in particular have got to be present in this in this information space. Absolutely, yeah. Um, in order to communicate effectively, there are there are other mediums, but but uh, we'll you know we'll we'll have their backs. You know, you if you stay professional and you and you keep it keep it. Forthright, uh, you know, I don't think I don't think I've ever seen anybody have any any challenge that that wasn't you know self induced, right? So I think that it's just a place like anywhere else. You know, back maybe back in the day, uh, you say something wrong and you might get popped in the mouth, right? You know, back in the old days. But 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 now it's a different. A lot kind of truth of to that now. A lot of truth to that. Yeah, I know right. when I grew up, if you no, said something wrong, they'd, yeah yeah, go ahead. <laughs> and, and so so now I, I think that's you know just an analogy for for the, this. You know, you said social media space, so people will pop back, but you got to be ready to fight sometimes. Uh, but if you but if you keep it straight, you keep it. In my opinion, you know my my technique is is all positive. 
Like there's nothing negative about my social media. Everything that I do on social media is a, is positive. And and frankly, most things in my life are positive, right? So it's not it's not a bash. It's real. Um, but you know, I'm I'm not going to get sucked into that that negative space. And and I think yeah, you know what I do is I I stay away from negative people. Yeah. I mean, I just yeah. push them off to the side, and I don't listen to stuff. I mean, people say stuff, I just, uh, you know, I don't, I don't really yeah. care. In fact, I tell people, as long as you don't touch me, I don't care. You can say whatever you want about me, but I don't care, right? Uh, this, first of all, let me tell you, thank you for what you guys are doing. I, I just, I, I, I tell you what, every time I have uh, all of our guests, or, you know, we've, we, I think we did over 150 or 60 shows now, but, but we've had a lot of great guests, but it's always pumps me up when I get uh, a couple of people on the show that just care so much about our country and about our army and about what we do each and every day. So thank you. Thank you so much for uh, what you continue to do. Any final thoughts, anything you want to share with the audience? Uh, sir, we'll start with you. Anything that maybe you missed that you want to tell the audience? Yeah, well, one, I'll, I'll give you a quick tidbit and you can use this with your future guests. So it's back to our information conversation and we put this in doctrine. So when you left, I think you remember we talked about forms of contact or eight forms of contact. Now there's well, not. Wait a minute, sir. When I left, they had a, a little can and a string or something like that. We were talking about. <laughs> but, ahead, but in sir. terms of, you know, forms of contact, you know, we added influence. So now that's doctrinal. So influence yeah. is a form of contact. I mean, it truly is. I mean, I can do it physically, but back to your, your original point, you know, influence, you, you can do that in a lot of different ways. And information space is one of them. But I'll, I'll end, you know, estimate back to, you know, link to a question you asked earlier. If I had to give, you know, one answer to, you know, soldiers that are, or people that are civilians that, are, that want to transform into a soldier, want to come into our army, or somebody that's making a decision to stay, is, is explore your options. I mean, there's a ton of great options. You know, if, you know, you're looking, you know, for a profession, for something that connects to you, something that can help you in life, I mean, look at the army. Don't close that door. I think a lot of our youth have doors closed to them and in some cases, it's just by word of mouth or something they see, but explore it for yourself. If it's a point of you don't know if you really want to stay, we have a great organization. We have a great institution. Is it perfect by any means? No. I think we all know that like any other organization, but but we're great. That is a key difference. But explore your options in terms of what you can do. And you talked about, you know, we, we at some point in time, we have that switch, you know, clicked in our careers. And for me, it was company command. I had three company commands back to back. And that's when it really clicked in my head. It's truly about the people. I mean, what you can do, what you can give back to others, what you can help others do to succeed, that's what it's about. Albert Einstein, you know, I use his definition for success and he said, strive not to be a success, but strive to be of value. So if you go and be in value every single day, you're gonna just multiply that value of those in that formation. And it's about the people and the quality of life. I mean, all those things are linked together. And that's something our soldiers, our families should not have to think about is everything that falls under that umbrella of quality of life, my daycare, my schools, am I going to be taken care of? Shouldn't have to worry about that because we put a lot of demands on them, you know, day in and day out. And things that we don't talk about, you know, when it comes to our soldiers, our civilians, you know, it's the love component of it. You got to love them. I mean, in order to be as fired up as, as we are and as you are, it's because you love them. You love the people. And, and someone once told me, they said, we can love you and not demand you, but that's going to spoil you. Yeah. We can demand a lot from you and and not demand a lot from you and not love you that's going to ruin you we, we got to do both because because our nation's going to demand a lot our leaders going to demand a lot from us but we also got to remember we got to love you know everybody on our team that balances it out right so we don't want to spoil people we don't want to ruin them we just got to get that balance right in terms of demand we're going to place on you which we know which is expected because you pointed out earlier you know joe millie said it best when we take that home we write a blank check payable to the american public with up to our lives that, that is the best way to capture it. And, and so the demands are there, but we got to love our soldiers and our civilians and everybody part of our team, you know, in order to balance it out. So as leaders, we got to take care of what we got to take care of. And I don't think you will see that in any other organization out there, you know, around the globe. I mean, only in our great army is where you see that, you know, and, and again, when we don't get it right, that's always a goal, right? Striving for that perfection in that balance of love and demand. And I'll, I'll end there. Now you got me with happy feet. My yeah. feet are all <laughs> well, you know, the, well, the other thing is you got to care. You got to yeah. care. And they, and they know people, uh, this is real old stuff. Are you real or Memorex? This is, you know, probably before you're born here. But, <laughs> but, uh, but, but it's a fact that if a soldier knows that you care or a family knows that you care, they're in. 
But if they know you don't care, they're, they're not going to do anything for you. I mean, I used to, I had a platoon one time, and I got up there, and I was yelling at them, doing all sorts of stuff. And, and a guy, after I did, I ran around the back of the formation. says, how do you get away from saying that stuff? Because I said some pretty bad stuff. I probably I was mad about some stuff. I said, because they trust me, and they care about me, and, I, and they know I care about them, and they knew they screwed up. You know, so all I'm doing is making them a better person, a better soldier, because, again, there's no second best in what we do, and I'm not going to cut any corners for the men and women that I'm going to fight with. Sergeant Major, you want to, any final thoughts? No, I thought that was that was brilliant uh, from both of you, so I appreciate that. I'll just finish by saying thank you to the team, your next mission team, for having us on. It's been a real honor yeah. to spend some time with you today. I wish we had more time, frankly. Uh, this has been amazing, and thank you for the opportunity to, to talk about our passion. For the army. Yeah. All right. I'm going to test this for what you do. Well, I'm going to see how motivated you are. I'm going to say one, two, three. Now, I had to come some guests here before and I had them say hua. Let me see how wimpy you guys are. So, one, two, three. I want you to say hua now at the end. One, two, three. Hua! All right. I love it. I love it. <laughs> hey, thanks for the guy. Hua, hua. <laughs> hey, thanks to Lieutenant General Milford H. Beagle Jr. and CSM Stephen H. Helton for, for being with us today. I'm Jack Tilly, 12th Sergeant May of the Army, and you've been watching your next mission video podcast. And thank you for joining us today. Please visit our website at yournextmission.org and leave me a review. I always say, I hope it's a good review, but if it's a bad one, I guess you can see I'm still pumped up. I can take that one too. While you're there, you can visit our nonprofit and corporate partners and, and see all the jobs and services that are available to assist you in your transition from the military. And we just added a new job board in partnership with Recruit Military where you can search for a job that's just right fit for you. Check out this video and our website to learn how to fine tune your search. You can also create your own individual profile. Scan the QR code on the screen or the code on the website to create your own profile. All information is collected and confidential and won't be shared by anyone. Please know we want to help you any way we can. You can follow me on all my personal social media pages, Facebook, Twitter, currently known as X, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Rumble. And if you like what we're doing with your next mission, click on that subscribe button below. Don't forget to click on the bell too to receive notifications of all of our upcoming video podcasts. Don't forget, we want to hear from you. Leave me a message or send me a text at 844-424-1134. Send me an email at smatilly at uh, yournextmission.org. Thanks again to Lieutenant General Beagle and Sergeant Major Helton for being with us today. It was just great having them on the show. And, and if you're not pumped up, something's wrong. Today, we had the honor to talk to two professional soldiers that care more about our country than a lot of people. They see the importance of our military. They see the importance of, of making sure that we have the freedoms that we want and need each and every day. You know, uh, I don't joke about this, but I, but I want people to know when I went in the military, when they went in the military, they raised that hand and said, I will protect and defend the Constitution of the United States against all of enemies, foreign and domestic. And, and what that means, and I know you know what it means, it means that I'm willing, they're willing to die for your freedoms. Again, thanks for watching. Thanks to New Mind Studios and, of course, our sponsors, Navy Federal Credit Union, Purdue Global. Blue Cross Blue Shield FEP Dental and Blue Cross Blue Shield FEP Vision and USA. We appreciate all you do for our military. And as always, see you on the high ground. Hua! You've been listening to Your Next Mission, brought to you by the American Freedom Foundation. Learn more by visiting yournextmission.org.